So what is first philosophy? This is a very old question. In many ways, it begins with Aristotle, with Aristotle's notion of proto-philosophia, of first philosophy, which is understood, for the most part, as the study of first principles or universals. And this is, to a great extent, covered in uh, Aristotle's metaphysics, in which he responds to the question of the meaning of being in terms of being qua being, what is being itself. And he answers in a variety of different ways, and the history of philosophy has answered in a variety of different ways. Whether it's seen being as a particular being, a particular kind of being, or as a particular category, or as a particular science of a particular kind of being. Mathematics, for example, studies mathematical beings. Physics studies physical beings. Psychology, the being of the mind, if you will. But of course, metaphysics studies being itself. So being has been thought in the history of philosophy in many different ways, as idea, substance, God, the soul, reason, will, will to power, etc., etc. What does Aristotle say, though? Aristotle says in the Metaphysics, being and unity imply one another. So first philosophy cannot really just be the study of being qua being, ontology but also has to be the study of unity. Because as Aristotle says, everything that applies to being also applies to unity. And therefore, metaphysics, or first philosophy, has to be the study of being and unity, or henology, from the Greek tohen, which means unity. In this way, first philosophy would have to be ontohenology. But Heidegger says, time is the horizon of any understanding of being. Therefore, we would all, and time is a universal. Therefore, we would also have to study time if we're going to study being and unity. First philosophy would then have to be ontohenochronology, if you will, if chronology is the study of time, because everything that is, is temporal for Heidegger. But language, well, the, ling the linguists tell us that all verbs, including being, have both time and aspect. So first philosophy, if it's going to study universals, would have to study being, unity, time, and aspect, because any verb has both time and aspect. I've called this science of aspect, or study of aspect, in a nod to Husserl in the history of phenomenology, phenomenology, even though what I mean by it is not phenomenology in the Husserlian sense, rather phenomenology in the sense of the study of aspect. So, first philosophy is ontohenochrono phenomenology, or let's just call it metaphysics for short. So, first philosophy studies being, unity, time, and aspect. But to a great extent, it studies it by raising the question of what it is. Heidegger, however, is very clear. He says that the what is determined by the how. So too, for these universals. The question becomes not only what it is, but how are they? Aristotle, once again, in the Metaphysics says, being and unity imply one another. There we have it. How are they, being and unity? They imply. They are implied. They imply one another. Why? Because they're implications. What does it mean, then, to imply? Implication is precisely the suspension of the presence and absence, or the presence or absence of the implied. What do I mean by this? Let me, I'll give three examples in three languages. Because in these various languages, implication comes to the fore in different ways, but I hope it will make it clear. In Greek, in English, and in Russian. In Greek, Heraclitus says, ethos anthropodaimon. Normally, this is translated as man's character is his fate, or human character is daimonic. But in the Greek, the word is does not appear. Ethos, anthropo, daimon. Character, human, daimonic, or human character, daimonic.
man's character, if you will, traditionally using that term, implied being daimonic. So too in English, Keats's famous poem, Ode on a Grecian Urn, perhaps the most famous line of poetry in the entire English language, says, beauty is truth, truth beauty. Beauty is truth, truth beauty. What happened to being? Being is implied, precisely. In the second half of that phrase, being is implied, because being is an implication. That's its way of being. And in Russian, the first line of Dostoevsky's notes from underground says, Ya chelvek balnoi, ya sloy chelvek. Normally, this is translated as, I am a sick man, I am a wicked man, or something like that. But the Russian doesn't say that. The Russian says, I sick man, I wicked man. Of course, you don't need to have being in these phrases, in any of these phrases, because it's implied, precisely. In this way, poetry or fiction or Heraclitus uh, philosophy, philosophical poetics, reveals the way in which being is, but not only being, because being implies unity, and being and unity imply time and aspect. And therefore, all of these implications, if you will, are implied. How so? They're implied not only in poetry, but if they're poetic, it's because they're implied everywhere. They're implied in things, thoughts, words, deeds. The question then becomes, what does it mean to imply? Grice has written quite a lot on this, and he argues that we should go back to Kant to see what kind of categories we can use for understanding implications. And he takes two from Kant, namely necessary and possible. So there are necessary and possible implications, necessary and possible ways of implying. Being is necessarily implied in the being of a being, as is unity, as is time. If it is, it is one, temporally and aspectually. Or if it's possible, then two, it would have its possible way of being one temporally and aspectually. But for Kant, there's also a third, a third category in addition to necessity and possibility, namely the problematic. And here's really where we get a sense of, if you will, the essence of implication. Because it's precisely the way in which the implied suspends our assurance of the necessity and possibility of what is being implied that reveals to us what we mean by implication. So implication suspends, as I said, the implied, and that means that the status of what is implied is problematic. If it is possible or necessary, it's because it is already problematic. And it would then be out of this problematic suspension of the presence and absence of the implied that we might determine the possibility and the necessity of what is being implied. Thus, first philosophy, if it's the study of being in unity, time, and aspect, as implications, ontohenochrono phenomenology, is ultimately the study of the problem of the suspension of implications.